page. Thanks, Dad. I appreciate that introduction. That was, um, that, that, um, I didn't know who you were talking about most of that time. <laughs> Look, I got a brand new um, thing with Jig uh, for my big book. That's what's in here, nothing special. And, uh, well, it is special, of course, but it was given to me by one of my home group members, and that makes it special. Uh, let me tell you a little story about that. We had a Christmas party. I'll go real quick. And, <laughs> and um, Steve is my sponsor, and, he, and he's, he's grading me tonight on this. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, so we had a Christmas party, and everybody brings a gift and gives it to somebody, but if you win it, somebody can take it from you. Well, this wonderful book cover, nicer than this one. I won, and this home group member came up and took it and left me something like a Chinese trooklet or something, you know, <laughs> a rabbit's foot or something, you know. And anyway, so to make up for it, he gave me this one. Anyway, not, 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 that's not very important. And I, uh, I'm going to just refer to one thing in this book. Uh, I got it in my mind, but it, uh, I like the way these people uh, can say things better than I can and so forth. So I'm, I'm going to refer to at least one thing in the book that I, I, don't, um, I don't just say. Uh, so anyway, I'll start at the very beginning. My name's Paige Wood. I'm an alcoholic. And my sobriety birth date is March the 31st, 1989. And uh, I didn't come up with that. Uh, that was given to me. And, uh, and a man even told me how to say that. I didn't know how to say that, but I did, and so forth. Um, <laughs> anyway, Stephen just celebrated thir uh, 48 years at, at, at our home group. He spoke for us. And uh, it's taken almost 34 years for him to learn to say his sobriety date the way I say mine. And his <laughs> anyway, when you say, say it the way we do. So, Anyway, <laughs> listen, I'm excited about being asked to be here. I, I love that. I like the invitation. Uh, uh, I'm not up. I'm not um, uh, qualified for it. I, I, I'm here by just grace and, 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 and um, the mercy that I've received. And I'm honored to be here. I love this group. And, um, but um, so I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. But I'm not glad about why I'm here. I, I hate this part of it. Now, I'll be all right once I get started. I'll just drift into this thing and something will happen, and, and, and we'll, we'll go right at this thing. But in the meantime, I'm going to make you feel comfortable and just talk a little bit. Uh, that's really to make me feel better, you know, type thing. <laughs> so anyway, I got that sobriety date. I got a home group, the Cane to Bleed group of Rocky Mount. And I, what, what I really love about that is I helped name it 24 years ago it's today, June the 1st. Yeah. It, 24 years ago, we started the group that I'm in um, on June the 1st, 1999. And um, we've never missed a meeting, not due to rain, sleet, snow, hail, loss of electricity, or pandemic. We have met in person all that time. And we even threw in WhatsApp for two or three years, and then we threw in the Zoom stuff. And we still Zoom, but we, we have never not had an in-person meeting. We've been as small as two people show up in a 18-inch snow. And, um, and we sat there, and, and it was um, Amy Miller was with me, and she said, well, let's go home. Nobody's going to show up. I said, no. We, we said we're going we're gonna to be here from 7 to 8, and we're going to be here from 7 to 8. Somebody might show up. And we heard a, a knock at the door. And a guy had walked from the neighborhood maybe a mile away in 18-inch snow in the cold, and uh, he'd been kicked out of Raleigh and forced to move back home to his mom's house and living with her because he lost his job his marriage and his license. And he walked to this meeting and we just, we sat, we were there, it's about halfway over and we were ready to go. And uh, I don't know where we were going because nothing was open, but we were going. <laughs> and uh, yeah, with the town, everything was shut down. He walked in 
and he was crying and, and all upset and, 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 and we sat him down, we got him a cup of coffee and, and, uh, and just started talking to him. The whole meeting was about him and uh, he wanted to commit suicide. His whole life was done. Lost his marriage, had a little baby, lost his job, lost his license and now living at home with his mom. Well, we stayed with him almost two hours. There was no electricity on, not, no heat on. We had lights, but there was no heat on in that church that night. We, we were freezing right there. We stayed with him, and we gave him a ride home. And uh, that's the last we saw of him. Now, we didn't read anything in the, in the papers about it or anything like that. But again, it was so important that, that if we're, if we're going to meet, we're going to meet type thing. So anyway... Um, I got, I got this home group. We meet on Tuesdays and Fridays, and we're a big book study. Uh, we, we study the book uh, kind of funny. We start at the very beginning, and we read every word from the front to the back. We even talk about, at the very back of the book, this pamphlets. And we, we talk about the pamphlets before we close the book and start all over again. And so, anyway, uh, we're, we're a big book study on the uh, first three Tuesdays. The fourth Tuesday... We do a tradition. It takes us a year to go through that 12 and 12, one, one tradition a month. And it uh, takes about two and a half years to do the big book. And then when there's a fifth Tuesday, we study AA history. And then on Fridays, we got a closed discussion. The chairperson gets to pick the topic, any AA-approved literature. And uh, not like me, I used to bring things in like the Reader's Digest or something or, <laughs> or something like that because I thought it had a good article, you know. But anyway, approved conference literature, the Bible is not on that list. I'll just, I'll just say that just for trivia. Anyway, so, uh, and then he, he'll, he or she, we still do the he and she, uh, uh, I, well, I, I don't want to drift off that way either. So anyway, we, golly, I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, the chairperson picks the topic, reads about it, and, and just throws it out there and calls on members, members. And then if we have time, we'll call on a guest and, and so forth. But usually we, we talk it up. So that, and then the last Friday of the month, we do what we, you're doing now, we have an open speaker meeting. So that's our format and our home group, and we'd love for you to visit anytime, Tuesdays or Fridays, and, um, and uh, you'd be more than welcome. I'm going to read this statement, and, and so I could get rid of this book. Not really, literally, but um, it's on page 29, and um, it says in here, this little paragraph, uh, that an individual, I'm one of them, uh, can describe in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain why that's important to me. So I come to AA, and I don't know anything, and, and you'll, you'll know that in a few minutes for sure. I came here, and I'm, I'm born in an alcoholic family, uh, my father's a bad, uh, bad drinker. His father was. His father was. Uh, the, my uncles and and, and my uh, my fa father's brothers. All, it, all. We just got a lot of alcoholism and a lot of problems. Um, we we have a lot of suicide in our big family, and I don't know why that is either. But in any case, got this family, and um, uh, so. Why, why wouldn't I know something about what I got? Well, number one, I didn't know I had it. That, that's, the, that's the number one thing. And um, I want to put that away so I don't just think about that. So um, when I talk about that, um, I'm going to uh, describe how I found a relationship with God. So I get here to AA, and one of the first things I learn is frothy emotional appeals don't work. Well, my ex-wife didn't know that because she would beg me all the time, why don't you come home after work? Can't you come home? Uh, we got a ball game tonight uh, with our son. We got to go shopping. We got to do this or that. Can't you just come home without drinking one time? And, uh, and I just couldn't do it. Uh, I, I commuted. Uh, we lived up on a lake, and I, I worked uh, about an hour away, and then my job took me 
way off. And so I, I'd get back, but I just couldn't, I just could not get in a car and not drink. I, I, it's, it's, it's strange today. If you go to my truck, I've got, a, I got two or three drinks in there right now, two or three bottles of water. I got a soda pop, some stuff like that, you know. I, I just can't hardly get in a vehicle that I don't start drinking. And back then, it was booze. I had a terrible encounter with the highway patrol one time. It was snowing. It was a bad day. And uh, I had this Labrador dog with me. And I hadn't trained him very well yet. And uh, if, if you didn't stay right with him, he'd eat the truck. And, and, and I don't mean, I mean, uh, seriously, he, he loved leather, ch leather chairs and bicycle wheels, bicycle seats, uh, the siding on the house. He, he just loved, uh, he was teething and everything, I guess. But anyway, the highway patrolman asked me, invited me back to his car, and it's snowing. And it's late. I've been drunk about three times that day. And, uh, <laughs> and I had what I call a mixed drink. So that was one of those big Dixie cups. And you buy a pint, and you pour it in there, and you put a little ice in there. And so that's your mixed drink. And, and it's sitting in that cheap right between us. The highway patrolman says, come on back. I want to, got to talk to you. And I said, I can't. <laughs> and he looked at me like I'm crazy, and, and, and I was, you know. And uh, so anyway, he said, uh, what do you mean you can't come back there? Come on back to this car, you know, and I said, I can't. You see that dog, and he, of course he could see him, because that big old Labrador was just slobbering all over that nice uniform and everything. And he smelled. Uh, he'd been duck hunting all day with me in the swamp waters. He'd been drinking a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he said, OK. And so he sat there, and I thought we were talking, uh, just friends. Uh, he told me he'd just moved from the Outer Banks to this area, to this patrol area, and that he was, he was looking for a Masonic Lodge. And I told him, well, I can hook you up. And uh, I'm a master of one of them, and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, so I just thought we had become friends. And uh, <laughs> I'm surprised I didn't offer him a drink. <laughs> anyway, he gets ready to leave, and he leaves, and he said, oh, and by the way, here's this. And he, all that time, he's talking, and he's writing a ticket the whole time. <laughs> longer and longer, you know. So anyway, so I don't know what that had to do with anything. Uh, uh, other than it's just how, how crazy my drinking was and how it would get out of control. So anyway, frothy emotional pills don't work. Then I learned in AA that the intellect will not get me sober. And I'm a pretty smart guy, I thought, you know. And um, I had uh, stole my way through education. Uh, you know, I'm a liar and a cheat and a thief. And, and I had used those methods to get uh, credential. And um, so anyway, um, the intellect won't get me sober. I said, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? And said, and then I learned that even a sponsor, as good as they are, and even a home group, as nice as that is, won't keep you sober. You know, that old thing about members, meeting makers make it, well, that, that's, um, that's foofa. That, that, that's not true either. Uh, so, uh, that, uh, I heard a talk, a uh, uh, cassette talk this week, and, and the guy said that um, in the beginning, when he came to AA, he was going to meetings every day, and I did. I went to two or three a day. And, um, and, and then he was, uh, had a sponsor, and he had a home group and everything. But when the calling came, there was nothing between him and the drink. There was no God between him and that drink, and he drank again. It took him 13 more years to get back to AA. So anyway. I learned that um, the education won't keep me sober, the home group will, will not, and all of that's good. Every, in fact, I think it's necessary. But again, so then the book, the textbook went right on to say, but God could and would. And what my problem is, is a lack of power. Now, I didn't know that, but when I heard, had it explained to me, I really felt that. And I, I'll, I'll tell you about my drinking, about how alcohol gave me power. And so, anyway, uh, uh, I, I resonated with that statement that I lack power. Then I didn't agree with 
this thing about selfishness and self-centered is the root of my problem. I, I had to learn about that. You know, there's educational process through AA, and there's a spiritual awakening like one of the co-founders had, and I had a part spiritual awakening like that, a Bernie Bush type of experience. I, wanna, I want you to know I had that. I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's the most second spiritual experience I ever had. The first one I had when I was 13 years old. Let me tell you about being 13. My wife, Mary, uh, I know all you old married people know this stuff, but when you get married, uh, it, it becomes a union. And, and so uh, their problems become your problems. Their joy becomes your joy. Uh, that kind of stuff happens. And so Mary's got this little 12-year-old grandson. Now, my grandchildren, contrarily, uh, the youngest is 24, the oldest is 34. So it, it's a whole new dynamic. And so I've been through what she's going through with my grandchildren. The other thing is, Mary, my wife, knows my story. She could probably be here tonight and tell my story. Uh, I could be, she's, she's speaking in Wilson tonight. I could be in Wilson and, and tell her story. So in any case, she's got this little 12-year-old grandson that she just adores. And then she's got this husband that he, she knows what he was like at 13. Oh my gosh. And so she's in, she's in trouble. <laughs> so anyway, at, at age 13, I'm growing up in a home that um, uh, wouldn't look like uh, any normal home in the whole wide world because it's not. We were very poor. Now, I, I tell you something, I learned maybe 20 some years ago in AA. I heard a girl in Raleigh tell a story so moving and, and so dramatic or, or something of, about the living conditions that she survived to be at the podium from, from childhood and about how horrific bad it was. And I, I said to myself then, I will never, ever, never say never ever, but I will never ever compete at the podium for how bad it was because I'll be beat and as bad as mine was. And I'll tell you how bad mine was. If you gotta go next door to borrow a bucket of water when you're six and seven years old because you don't have any water at home and your mom says, Paige, son, go next door and get the neighbors to loan us a bucket of water. I'd go, oh my gosh. Now see, I got a speech impediment. I'm ashamed of the old, ragged, poor clothes we got, hand-me-downs, and I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed that we, the power's turned off in this old house. It's cold, we don't have any food, we don't have any water, and I'm over there borrowing a bucket of water of all things. And I don't know that we ever paid a drop of it back. I just, <laughs> I, I've only thought of that when I got to AA and I start making amends and everything. So anyway, uh, I'd go over there, and that old lady, she never made a little kid feel embarrassed or, or hurt. She would say, well, why are you here? I'm baking so-and-so. Can I offer you something? And my stomach is just going nuts. I ain't eating about three days. And they oh, no, 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 we don't. Oh, we'll carry it back home to your brother. And so she'd make me carry food back home. But she'd make you feel like you were doing her a favor. And, and she wasn't helping you. So God is, God is good. God is good. Even when you don't know he's good or when you don't trust that he's good or when you don't even care about him. I didn't care about God. I, that's something else we'll talk about. So anyway, um, so I tell you that that statement means a lot to me when I come to find out that the only thing that's going to help me is this relationship with a God. Said that God could and would, and, and, and that my problems are lack of power, and He is the source of the power. It's written right in the book. And so I, I, I said, okay. But I didn't catch on to that right away. I'm not a quick study at, at staying sober or anything. I've stayed continuously sober since I came here, but it's by, because of our grace and mercy, sponsorship, home group that, that I have done this. And prodded with the action of the steps and, and take the steps because and, and it's an action program. I like, the, uh, I like what I've been told by somebody in AA that um, go lock yourself in that closet 
and pray for a hot dog and, and sit down and wait for it to come through the keyhole. Well, you are starved to death doing that. You got to open the door and go get the hot dog. That's the action of, of, of taking the step and so forth. And so you get those results. But if you just sit there, you read them or you study them, that's, that's not the same as taking them. That takes a little while for somebody like me to learn. So anyway, I, um, I'm 13 years old, um, and I'm embarrassed to be alive. And um, we're poor, and um, our father doesn't come home. He's gone for weeks at a time. Um, uh, men in AA from Wilson sponsored my father. And he used to come to my home when I was a kid uh, and sit with my mom Steve talks about the old days that we don't do 12 steps the way they did. We don't do A the way we did 48 years ago or 34 years ago, uh, and we don't. But uh, those two old men would come almost every Saturday, and my father wasn't there. They didn't come for my father. They came for my mom and the kids. And they would bring bags, paper bags, they didn't have plastic, paper bags of groceries. They'd even bring coffee because we didn't have coffee. My mom would jump up, get the coffee real quick out of the bag and make some, and sit there for several hours on Saturday morning with them. They talked to her, they bring comfort to her. And uh, well, I wouldn't be at the podium today had that not some of that happened. But um, anyway, they came into my life through AA in the very beginning, those two old men. So anyway, uh, I'm 13 years old, and I got no reason to drink. I, um, uh, I've seen the, the, the worst effects of it in the world. My father, and I'm not going to dwell on this forever, I uh, just got to mention that he would come home and he'd beat my mom. And she's a little teeny woman, and uh, he would beat her right to the floor. Then I got three beautiful sisters and, and one brother and myself. I'm the youngest. And he'd start with the oldest sister, and she's still living. The other two sisters have passed away, and, uh, and their husbands and so forth. But anyway... The matriarch of our family is still alive and, and doing well and guiding us and loving us and taking care of us. But uh, they beat her. He beat her first and then go right on down the line to get to me. I knew it was coming. Golly, I wanted to be first sometimes. And, uh, but uh, you don't. So anyway, then he would just tear the house up. He was just, you know, knock things over, turn things over. He was angry. i tell you what it was, and I learned those words in AA, restless uh, restless, uh, discontented, uh, angry, um, uh, full of self-reproach, uh, just, just hated himself, but he couldn't look in the mirror. He had to look at us for, for the way he felt. He'd come home when he was dead broke and almost physically uh, ill. Uh, he, he wouldn't eat uh, when he was on those benches and, and everything. And, uh, so anyway, he'd come home and uh, he'd beat the family. He tear the house up. He just as likely uh, mess up in the corner as he had to get to the bathroom if he could or couldn't. My mom, and then he would pass out. We lived in this little teeny home, and there's, there's seven of us in there, and we got two bedrooms where he occupies one, whether he's there or not. Nobody goes in there. My mom, I don't know where we came from because I don't ever, to this day I don't believe my mom slept with him. I mean, I, that's how, I mean, really, really, I don't, you know, there ought to be some DMA, or not DMA, but some kind of testing, you know. Uh, my mom would not have done that. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, it, was, it was just bad. My mom would get up and she'd fix herself and she'd go around to each of us and fix us, whatever had to be done. She'd clean that house up. She'd clean that mess up. She dragged him off to that bedroom. Now she slept uh, on a couch in this big room we had. He slept in the back room. And my three sisters, they slept in one bed in this bedroom. In the same bedroom, my brother and myself slept in our little bed. We had a, a little bed and they had a big bed. And uh, so all five of us lived in that bedroom. 
And um, we had one bathtub. My brother kept fish in it. He would, uh, that's what we <laughs> ate a lot. <laughs> that's what we ate a lot was he'd catch fish and he'd bring them home and keep them in the bathtub. My sisters hated that. <laughs> you know, especially because we didn't have a whole lot of water to clean up with or anything, you know. So <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was unique. But that's, that's the home that I grew up in. And so you would say, well, that kid would never drink. And so at age 13, when my time came, I was as powerless over taking that drink as maybe my dad was or I would be before AA. I'm just powerless over alcohol. And I, at my time, I came to drink. And at age 13, on a little camp out in the backyard, there was four. I was three guys and myself. We were camping out. And we belonged to a women's haters club. And, uh, <laughs> but we didn't hate women. We loved our mom. We loved our sisters. We, we liked some of the school teachers, that kind of stuff. But we were afraid of the girls. Oh, my gosh. Now, we liked them. We just didn't know how to say that or to do that or to, or to express that. We would just sort of look at you from across the street. That's about as close as I could get to you. And, um, <laughs> anyway, we had this women's haters club. We had BB guns, and we had a tree house. We'd shoot little birds and, and eat them and things like that. And the other thing is, uh, uh, on this telephone here is access to almost anything in the world. There's a, there's a big word called pornography. Uh, on there that, that describes all kinds of stuff, and it's it's on this telephone, uh, and but back then we had what they called a magazine, and we would get these magazines, and uh, I don't know where we got them, but we had a treehouse full of them, <laughs> and we would sit up there and look at these magazines. And we'd say, oh, I'm going to do that, or. or I did that, you know. <laughs> we, we hadn't done anything. We, uh, we knew all of us were lying, you know. Well, anyway, that night, I'm going to talk about this first drink, and I'm done with it. And so that night, we somehow or another, as poor as we all were, and all, all these other three guys just as poor as we were, I was, somehow or another, we had got the money together for one six-pack of Pat's Blue Ribbon Beer. Uh, Pat, P, B, Pat's Blue Ribbon, PBR. And I'd, I'd never heard that when I was a kid drinking Pat's Blue Ribbon beer, and I didn't know they still sold it when I got to AA type thing because I'd quit drinking beer by then. But anyway, somebody <laughs> told me, oh, you were drinking PBRs. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, Pat's Blue Ribbon. We had a six-pack. We wanted a legal pack of cigarettes. We had been stealing our cigarettes from our parents or picking them up off the street. People would, and, and we'd jump at it, you know, and if you could get one about that long, that was a, that was a deal. And so we, we, would, we would get these cigarettes. We wanted a legal pack of cigarettes. Now, we wanted the real cigarette. We wanted a Lucky Strike non-filter or a Camel or a Paul Ball, something like that. That guy that went off and got the beer got us a pack of Kent. Now, I don't know if they make Kents anymore, but it's about that long. <laughs> and, and it looks like a soda straw. And women uh, smoke it. You know, we wanted to be able to spit that little bit of tobacco that you get from a non-filter out. You go, you see it on old movies, cowboy movies. They go <coughs> like that, you know, a little bit of tobacco flies out. Anyway. We didn't get it. i tell you what else we didn't get. Back then, beer cans didn't pop open magically or anything. You had to have a device to get into them called a church key of all things. Uh, and, and he didn't get us one. I don't know if he thought we had our own church key or what. We didn't. But we had a hammer and a screwdriver. <laughs> <laughs> and we got them beers open. I drank most of the beer. I smoked most of those cigarettes. And... A little girl came over while we were camping out and visited uh, long enough to participate, and, um, and uh, she was a member of our club. <laughs> now, we didn't know then, and I don't know tonight, how we had a woman in our, not a girl, in our women's haters club. <laughs> the, the best I remember, she was a member in good standing. <laughs> 
So anyway, I had, I had those first legal cigarettes. I had that first past living beer, first thing I ever tasted alcoholic. And I had that first experience with that, um, I call her that young lady. And, um, and I'm going to tell you, and my speech impediment went away. <laughs> my old ragged clothes uh, went away, and I had on uh, the spiffiest little outfit that a kid could have on, nice sneakers and uh, nice jeans that didn't have those patches on the knee that your mom would iron on patches. Didn't have any of that. And, uh, and, uh, and I became a leader of those men with me those other three boys and, and so my life so I describe that the same way the textbook in the back describes spiritual experience if, if something radically changes the way you think and act that's the basis of a spiritual experience and that's what I had from beverage alcohol past blue ribbon beer or you could call it spirits and, but my life changed from that night to, to this night it, it is still affected uh, by one now under the power and control of Alcoholics Anonymous, but for 30 years it was under the power and control of alcoholism, active alcoholism. And I didn't become a daily drink. I didn't go live under the bridge when I was 13. You got to go to school. You got a paper route to do. You're a bag boy at the grocery store where you steal all you can. And uh, that was one of my big amends, is to go back to the Winn-Dixie and pay them for everything I'd stole uh, when, when I'd be working for them. Uh, not only food in the beginning, but cigarettes and booze. They would lock people like me in the store all night long. They'd lock us in. You can't do that now. That's against the law. They would lock us in, and we would have to clean the, the store. We used these big buffers. And, Somebody would sit on it and ride and drink, and the other one would, would push it around. And we, we had the best time at night, and we, we robbed that Winn-Dixie blind. So anyway, uh, didn't make amends for that. So anyway, at age 13, uh, my life took a new direction. And, uh, and so by the time I'm 17, I'd been a decent student, not a good student. I'd been a pretty good athlete. I ran track and I, and I played football. I was too little for it, but I played. I was mean though. That was, that, that, that was my advantage. I was a very mean kid. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit how I got or why I was that way. But I, I was that way because I hated my father. And uh, this is one of the toughest amends I've, I've had to do. And I didn't do it. God healed me. Uh, the absence of hate is love. Now, now, I can't explain much, much more than that. I don't hate my father anymore, but I don't love my father either. Even to this day, um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't worry about who or anybody thinks about that or my maker or my creator or anything. But I don't blame him any, anymore. He was an alcoholic and he was very sick and didn't get the help that I got. So anyway... Uh, but I hated him back in the day when he was beating my mom and beating us. And, and, uh, and uh, I'm that kid that um, is um, more than crazy. I believe it was my job as the youngest kid in that family was to take care of my sisters and my brother and my mom. And I believe that was on me. And that uh, the only way I could see to do that and to protect them was to get rid of him. And that meant killing. That, that, uh, that's just what it equated to be. Now... I didn't have anything that I, uh, that I cared for any more than a baseball bat that had been given to me by baseball players uh, that was in, in the area. We, we grew up near a ball stadium, and we used to chase balls for them. If you would get the, the fly balls, you could get in free, or they would give you a quarter for every ball. We're bringing back like $10 baseballs for, for 25 cents. Now, that, that's how dumb we were. I used to cut grass for 50 cents a yard. If the yard was this big, or if the yard was five acres, the little old lady would say, how much are you gonna charge me, 50 cents? She'd jump all over that, you know. You'd be out there for two days. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, I, I had this baseball bat, and my plan was, I'll just, uh, I'll just go at him with it. My idea was I'd get on top of the, the roof, 
And when he would drive up in the yard and he'd be drunk and be weaving and coming to the house, I would jump off the roof and land right square on his shoulders. He'd go down, I'd be on top, I'd have this bat, and I would just wham at him, you know, and I'd just go at it. And uh, took all summer. I'd lay up there sometimes and would go to sleep. I'd lay up there sometimes and he wouldn't come home. He'd come home sometimes, I'd be so fearful of him, uh, so afraid of him that I was, I was afraid to go through with the plan. I was afraid he wasn't drunk enough. I was afraid he would hurt me more or something. I just fear. Now, I didn't know it was fear, I, you know, because I'm fearless, I thought. So in any case, one night, it, it just felt right. Uh, he came home. I thought he was very uh, drunk and, and, and I, it could work, and I just jumped right off landed right on his shoulders just like I thought I could. He went down just like I thought he would. I started beating on him and I beat on him till my little arms, I'm just a kid, couldn't lift the bat anymore. And, and when that happened, I just laid it down right there beside him. Had, had no remorse, no guilt, no, uh, I, I wasn't afraid of the evidence or, or nothing. I went into the house to that little bedroom with my brother curled up next to him, my little sister's over there, hadn't been beat that night, hadn't even woke up, and my mom was sleeping on the couch, and I slept like a baby. And, and the next morning, neighbors had found him, and they'd called the, the police, they'd called the, the hospital, and, and uh, they came. Do you know, to this, from that day to this day, there was no knock on the door, there was no preacher at the door, there was no policeman at the door, there was no doctor at the door, there was no neighbor at the door, there was no grandfather at the door, there was no mother or brother or sister saying what in the heck happened. And it was just like, there's an elephant in the room but nobody's talking about it, and, and, and we never did. But my father, when he got, ho got home, got back, he did die. And, uh, <laughs> And I regretted that, and I told him, I said, man, just one more time, I'll, I'll, it, it, it won't be, that something else will happen. And, uh, but let me tell you what, let me tell you what else will not stop alcoholism. We know that frothy emotional appeal does not. We know the intellect will not fix it. Uh, we know that no human power, not your sponsor, not your friend, not your mother, Nobody can, can help you but God, okay? We, we put the butt in there. So anyway, uh, I can tell you what else don't fix alcoholism. A baseball bat being half beat to death. But let me tell you what it does fix. A man never touches his wife and his daughters and his son again. He never, ever laid a hand on us, not a hug, not a kiss. He didn't get this. He walked on this side of the house and we lived on this side of the house, and, 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 and I didn't let him come over. And uh, uh, I, I didn't. Uh, so uh, when I went off to the Navy at age 17, one, that was probably the best day of his life uh, when, when I was gone. And so I, I, I did, I, I ran away from home at age 17, lied about uh, my age, got in the Navy. You couldn't do this today because of the computers and all that. And uh, it wasn't, it seemed like it wasn't that long ago. It seems like yesterday. And, uh, you know, and I, I ran off to the Navy at age 17 and, and, and ended up uh, being around the world for a bunch of years after that. Um, I ended up on nuclear submarines of all places for an alcoholic to be. Uh, uh, people don't know this. Every nuclear submarine carries torpedoes. And they have something in there that tells them where to go, called a gyro. And those gyros need to be cleaned. And what you clean them with is 180 proof grain alcohol. <laughs> and uh, we had 55 gallons of it, about the size of that trash can right there. Guess who had the key? Me. <laughs> and, uh, so I learned to drink 180 proof grain alcohol on a nuclear submarine, and uh, and, and trip was fine. Just <laughs> let's go. <laughs> anyway, uh, we need to move pretty rapidly now. Um, so I go from just being like that, and I, I lose a marriage. 
I get right near to losing a job. I got one of the best jobs in the whole wide world. I don't even have supervision. I'm the corporate architect for a major firm. I get allowed to go all over the country spending 35, 40, 45 million dollars on, on projects uh, under my opinion and under my authority. I get to use a company airplane to help do that. I got a staff of like 28 people just sitting around waiting for something to do. And, um, and I'm doing that and I'm a blackout drinker. That's something I forgot to tell you. That first drink at age 13 and that Platts Blue Ribbon and that young lady and those kids, <laughs> I gag almost <laughs> thinking about it. Anyway, as much as I love to smoke a real cigarette, you know, I, I smoked about three packs a day for 30 years. So anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, almost lost, anyway, so I, um, I, uh, I go off in blackouts. I, I'm a blackout drinker. That first time I drank, I went into a blackout and, and I got charged the next morning. I did get a knock on the door that day by the police and I had shot out all the windows of a National Guard armory about three blocks away. Bam, pump gun, bam, pump gun, and, and, and everything. Now I didn't know that I did that. I don't remember doing that. But I had no defense from that. My three buddies ratted me out. They said he did it, <laughs> <laughs> and I, had, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't argue with it. I did I, I'm in a blackout. So anyway, I got in trouble for that, and I worked for my grandfather from the age of 13 to 17, 50 cents an hour to pay that back. And uh, I don't know that we ever paid it all the way back, but that's what I did. That was my job after that. So anyway, so. My, my last drink culminates with, with uh, a, a, a pretty bad deal. Everybody says, you know, like my last drink was just like a normal drink and everything. And I think mine was too, a little bit, other than the consequence. So I'm a daily drinker. I drink from the time I wake up to the time I pass out. And I, and I look like I'm functioning. I got on a white shirt and a tie and a blazer. And, and uh, I'm driving a company car and got a, a use of a company plane and I, I'm going all over the country, mostly the East Coast uh, regional type stuff, uh, five, seven states. And I normally go out and spend two or three hours doing business somewhere and come back. And that's, that's what they call my normal work day. And I bring home a bunch of stuff and I pass it off. Next day I go out stay a couple hours, have a few drinks, come back, type thing. And I'd, I'd reach in my pocket with these receipts, and I'd hand these receipts back off to my coordinators. And uh, they would figure out where I'd been and what I'd done and write it up in a report, type thing. I couldn't do it. So anyway, I, um, my, last, uh, my last big bender trip was um, we had a customer that wanted to sell us at, a, at an advantage some building products. Uh, we had uh, the need of a special soffit condition under these buildings that we're building and they had a product that would absolutely not warp with the heat and, and that kind of stuff called a Luca bond. They still make it. It's still a fabulous building product. It was way ahead of its time 30 years ago but anyway we were, I was negotiating to buy just tons of it to go on these buildings, and their factory and their home is in Detroit. We were going to have an international up there, and I was looking forward to going up to there to where the, my last episode uh, took place. So anyway, I went up to Detroit, and uh, I'm supposed to go up, have about a two-hour, maybe three-hour meeting, have a few drinks with them, and come home. Now, part of the problem was our company had just bought a brand new plane and it had been outfitted and had just been delivered and no one, that is the owners of this company, had seen it. It had just been on paper for them. They paid all the, all the money for it and, and uh, we still didn't have all the electronics on it. It doesn't come uh, with everything when you when you get it, you have to have it worked on and so forth. But it had it, it, it had most everything. 
And uh, so I go to the airport, and so, you know, what's, what's an alcoholic going to do? What, uh, Mr. Wood, what you want? I want that. And so off we go, you know. And uh, I didn't come back. Normally I go out, I'm gone a few hours, and I come back. I don't come back. And uh, they start looking, calling, where's Paige? Well, he took your new plane and went off. Where did, what, what's his flight plan? He went to Detroit. Well, kid him on the phone. He, he's, we've been trying to reach him. <laughs> anyway, I didn't come home. I didn't come home for about three days. And when I came home, they met me. My sponsor has met me at the Rocky Mount Wilson Airport. I'd come in from a business trip. He'd be out there. We'd get in the car and we'd go for a ride and things like that and, and talk and do things. But they met me at the airport. They knew I was coming in. I came in and, and they took me right straight. We got a farm. Uh, it's, a, it's a mansion out in the country uh, where they have the big family meetings. The family meeting is whether you're going to live or die type thing, <laughs> whether you're going to keep a job or not. You know? And we went out there and they said, Paige, uh, you're either going to get some help that we're going to offer you. We love you. We care for you. And we're going to offer you this help one time or you go into federal prison for what you've done. And, uh, and I thought, well, you know what? I just signed that wonderful contract for that Aluka bond. I'm saving the company thousands of dollars. That's what I'm thinking. And they're thinking, this idiot has stole our company planes. And, you know, <laughs> and, so, and so I said, uh, well, what kind of help are you talking about? And they said, well, we don't know. <laughs> But but we got a man, we own a treatment center, and we got a CEO of it, and we're going to get him to talk to you, and he, we're going to take his recommendation, whatever he says we're going to do. And are you willing to go to it? And I, are you willing to go talk to him? And I said, I don't know. Uh, how long are you going to give me to think about it? And uh, you've got to be a, a crazy apple falling off the tree to, to try to negotiate under those terms. And I did. I, I said... And they gave me three days, unbelievably. They said, we're going to give you three days, but if you ain't in that treatment center in three days, the sheriff is going to be picking you up. That, that's all it is, and, and we're not saying another word about it. And they let, me, they let me go home. They let me drive the company car that I had home. And I went home and had a little girlfriend living with me um, and a wonderful, wonderful person. She's a great member of AA Today. And I walked in, and she said, where in the hell have you been? They have been looking you. They've been out here two or three times looking you and calling. And, and, and I said, well, let me tell you what's been going on. And I, I, done. I couldn't tell her much. But I told her about this three-day negotiated deal that I had negotiated. And, and she said, well, let me fix your drink. And I said, OK. <laughs> and uh, that was my last drink. Uh, she said, uh, you want another one? And I said, I never turned down a drink in my life that I know of, that I know of. And I said, no, thank you. Well, she sat around with me for a few minutes, and she got bored sitting around with this guy that's not drinking. And uh, she said, well, I'm going next door. And uh, they got a party going on. There was some girls that lived next door, and they always had a party going on. And so she picks up some bottles, and she leaves. Well, I can tell you this. I don't know. I don't know this to this day because I'm, I'm, I'm in a pod. I don't know whether I ate for three days, whether I slept for three days, or what I did. I do know this, that the third day came and was almost, it was like the morning's gone. It's about 1030 in the morning. And this little roommate of mine said, hey, you got to make, you got to do something. Uh, you know. And I got up. And I got up. And I couldn't stand up. I fell down on the same wood floors that I'm going to go home to tonight. I got wood floors throughout the house. And um, not this faux type wood type stuff. I got real old wood floors in, in the house. I just love, love them. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I fell down on the floor and couldn't get up. I didn't have a bone in my bottle. Body. I didn't have a muscle in my body. I, 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 and the other thing is, I started crying. And, and maybe that's not uh, strange to somebody, but it was strange to me in that I'm a grown man. I'm, I'm 40, 43 years old, and I hadn't cried since my dad was beating me as a little boy. And, and I've had every kind of pain and, and mistreatment 
and uh, stuff that a man can have. I'm not virtuous to any kind of pain or suffering that somebody can go through, but I didn't cry about it. I'll tell you what that man taught me. That was my father. He taught me two or three things that were lies, but I didn't know that. He taught me that a man doesn't cry. He taught me that a man doesn't ask for help. He taught me that a man can do anything. And, and uh, I taught my son that. And I, and, I, and I didn't teach my grandchildren that way because by the time I got grandchildren, I'm in AA. And I've learned, out, learned that that's a lie. A man does cry. I love to cry. I'm not going to cry for you tonight. I know, lots of, I know lots of guys that cry at the podium. And I can almost tell you what adjective is going to bring it on when they're talking. Uh, these guys that I love, and, and they're, they're, they'll take that glass off and they'll, they'll give that little weepy look, you know, type thing. There's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> This is not meant to be ugly, and it's not, it's not given that way, and I hope you don't take it that way. Crying is almost as, as I won't say it is, but it's almost as good as a sexual climax or something. <laughs> when, when that relief comes from opening your heart, whether you're crying tears of joy or tears of sadness, and, and, and a man like me can just give it up, I cry today regular. When, when, when you see that flag, I'm a veteran, uh, you see that flag going, or you talk about Memorial Day, uh, or you hear that national anthem, I, I get all teared up. I get teared up when I see different things in movies and that kind of stuff. Uh, I love little babies today, and, and, and that little s silky skin they got, and, and, and to hold them. And, and, uh, my wife works uh, volunteer stuff in a pregnancy center and she does ultrasounds and oh am I getting close I am and <laughs> I'm getting close <laughs> so let me let me wrap this up with, with two things so I fall on the floor and I can't get up and I'm crying and here's what happened I cried out three words just three words God help me Three words, God help me. I didn't ask him to help me off the floor. I didn't help, ask him to help me with a drinking problem that I didn't know I had. I didn't ask him to uh, uh, help me keep my job. I didn't ask him to keep me out of prison. I didn't ask, I, I was not negotiating at all. I said, God help me. And in a few minutes I got up and I've been given over to you, to Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and home groups and sponsorship and the steps and, and, and I've and never, never been a freer man, never been a man more overpaid than I am in every area. Now, I, I have to tell you, that means, of course it means financially. It does mean that. It means physically. I've got my health back. It means emotionally. I know when up it is and when down it is, and, and, and I'm, I'm pretty stable. But most of all, I've, I've met God. I've met him personally. Um, uh, and... Um, so spiritually, I'm overpaid. So anyway, I'm going to close uh, in that, that, that God did help me. And, and I don't know where you were that, that morning, but God was in my, room, my bedroom with me that, during that time. And you were on your own. Anyway, I'm going to close with this statement. This is conference-approved literature. And um, I, 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 it means very much to me. And I, maybe it'll mean something to you. Conference-approved literature. This coming Sunday, in the churches of many of us, there will be read portions of the Gospel of Matthew, which recounts the time when John the Baptist was languishing in the prison of Herod. And here in the works of his cousin Jesus, he sent two of his friends, disciples, to say to him, Art thou he who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Christ did as he often did. He did not answer them directly, but wanted John to decide for himself. And so he said to disciples, go and report to John what you have heard and what you have seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, and the dead he deaf hear, the dead rise, and the poor hear the gospel preached to them. Now, the gospel means the good news. Uh, so that, that's what that means. So if you were to ask me, Paige, what have you seen since you've been here since um, the last 34 years? 
And I'd, have to, I'd just have to tell you, I can tell you only what I've heard and seen. It seems the blind do see, the lame do walk, the leopards are cleansed, the dead hear, the dead rise, and over and over again in the <coughs> middle of the longest day or the darkest night, the poor in spirit have the good news told to him. God grant that they may always be so. Thank you.